Thank you, Ethan and Daniel, and thank you, David and Sharon, for that beautiful testimony and song, and Alex for your hard work on the organ, and all others who have participated today. I want to mention one thing. I don't know if it was mentioned because I wasn't in the room, but during the lock-in a few weeks ago, part of the night, there, one of the options to do here at the church was to make a craft, and um, Della helped some of our youth out of old hymnals make a cross here and if you come up close you'll see that this cross is made up of pieces of favorite hymns that are rolled up and made into a cross shape so I hope that you'll be able to enjoy that we've wanted to find a way to display that periodically I have been given a a, a big notebook of sermons that John Claypool wrote when he was the pastor of Crescent Hill Baptist Church in Louisville 50 years ago and it's been really interesting to read these and to hear the contemporary, um, you know, prophecies about the culture and this, that, and the other from like 1960, 1961, and things like that. And in one of the sermons that I read this week, he talked about a time that he spent a week in 1960 at a local college doing a spiritual emphasis week. And his purpose in doing that was to go and in the evenings preach uh, revival-type messages with the Baptist Student Union and other groups in the evenings and during the day just to engage students on campus um, in religious conversations. And, okay, this is written 1960, 61, and he said, you know, I found when I encounter people on campus and want to talk about religious things, a couple of things happen. They either, A, are open to a religious conversation. Okay, that happens some or they're really opposed to religious conversation. That happens some. But then the, the vast majority of the people that I encounter are just kind of indifferent. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, that's about 1960. I wonder how different conversations would be today if we engage people regularly in religious conversations. He said he met one student who said, you know, I understand that you, you have concerns about this life and the life beyond, but really, my hands are full with the life here and now, and I'll just, I just have to deal with that, and I'll trust whatever happens to happen. It reminds me of what Henry David Thoreau said. He had, um, was encountered by um, a close friend when he was on his deathbed, and his close friend wanted to talk to him about the next world, the afterlife. And, and he said, one world at a time, brother, one world at a time. I just want to focus right here, right now. I think that a lot of people in our society would say, well, I'm just kind of focused right here, right now. But, you know, the disciple, and this is what we've talked about for at least a month now, when we think about the way of Jesus Christ, we really have our eyes in two places, here and now, and then beyond when we are reunited with God in heaven for eternity. Um, and Jesus would say that the things we do now and the things we say now and the ways that we minister now can have eternal consequence. It's not just about right here, right now. Um, and so in this passage that we're going to look at today, we'll see an, an instance where Jesus sent his disciples. I entitled the message, Going, but maybe it would be to be sent, or maybe the more appropriate message would be entitled Marching Orders. I don't know. Let's pray together. Gracious God, in these moments... I ask that you would keep us ever mindful of your steadfast love that extends before our lives and beyond them and that extends around us here and now. Not just in this place, not just in these walls, not just among believers that we know, but also to the whole world. Have us always be individuals who keep in mind your commission, your great commission. As we are going, teach us to proclaim your good news and to touch others in your name. May the words of my mouth and may the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In 2002, Rick Warren wrote a book entitled The Purpose Driven Life. And the subtitle of the book was this, What on Earth Am I Here For? Have you heard of this book? Okay, what on earth am I here for? Evidently, a lot of people wondered about that because since 2002, 
That book has sold 32 million copies, and it has been translated into over 50 languages. So a lot of people might be asking the question when they consider their own lives, what on earth am I here for? And I just want to read you the first sentence and the first paragraph of that book. The Purpose Driven Life, what on earth am I here for? It's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you were placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by His purpose and for His purpose. So in the next few moments, let's consider this calling that Jesus has invited us to be a part of, you participated in a responsive reading that highlights a lot of the sending passages in the New Testament. But I want us to focus for just a minute on one specific passage from Matthew chapter 10. This passage occurs in Luke 9 and it occurs in Mark 6. Each one of them is a little bit unique, but definitely very similar. I want to read these verses to you. When Jesus called his disciples around him and he kind of huddled them and said, here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going to go. Here's what I need out of you. This is your part that you can play. Chapter 10 of Matthew verse 5. I'll read verses 5 through 15. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And then I'll just add verse 16, just to keep us humble. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. Let me just read one more verse there. As you go, this is verse 7, proclaim the good news, the kingdom of heaven has come near. As you go. And here in, I guess you would call these maybe the marching orders, Jesus tells them several things. One, he tells them where they are to go. And at first, he says, don't go among the Gentiles. Go first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, which at this point is a little bit hard for us to read, recognizing that Jesus would say, well, don't go there, but go here. But I want to just kind of remind you that Jesus looked out at Israel and viewed them um, as sheep who were lost from their shepherd. And, and here we are reminded that Jesus had not forgotten that they had wandered and he was committed to reaching out to Israel. You know, the, the mission to the Gentiles would come later and it wouldn't exclude the Jews. Um, it came out of necessity because he remembered that, that God had chosen Israel and wanted to bless them so that they could bless the whole world. And, and Jesus was still very committed to them. And so Jesus told them where they're to go um, Jesus told them um, what they were to do. He said, as you go, proclaim the good news. As you go, proclaim the good news. And then he told them what they were to carry. What they were to carry. And I wonder, as we read what he told them to carry, I've, I've often thought, okay, he said you will encounter people who are sick, like the leopards, You'll touch the blind, you'll see the lame, you're to proclaim the good news, you're going to be taken in front of synagogues, you're going to need to cast out demons, and so here's what I need you to do. Here's what I need you to carry. He doesn't say, um, 
Step one, when you encounter a person who is lame, do this. He doesn't say step one when you touch the blind. Step one when you cast out a demon. He says, don't carry a lot of luggage. Don't carry extra clothes. Don't carry extra shoes. Don't carry a staff. Go from place to place depending on others. Isn't that interesting? Here they're going out on a mission, and he is more concerned about telling them what they are to leave behind. And I recognize that really Jesus is teaching them to depend upon God, their Heavenly Father. This is not about you. This is about God. An individual was invited to a church with his friend. He decided to go. And they came to a worship service, and this individual was really stunned. He had seen this big, old building, and all of a sudden he goes into this worship service, and there are hundreds and hundreds of people, and this church is just so dynamic and so loving and so engaged, not only with people in the room, but evidently with the community too. And he asked his friend, he said, wow, this church just feels to be so alive. And he said, you know, you should have been here 20 years ago. When I was here 20 years ago, there were less than 50 senior adults. And I would have guessed that there is no way in 20 years these doors would be open. But all of a sudden, then our pastor and some of our leaders said, let's focus on God for a minute. And we started seriously studying the scriptures. And you know... Since then, our pastor has been able to translate the Bible into seven words. And he said, oh, what, what, what are those seven words? God is God, and we are not. God is God, and we are not. And that church began focusing on the Lord and offering Him praises and they chose to begin a mission of service. They chose to be servants. Now, you can choose to serve, right? Richard Foster kind of says it this way in Celebration of Discipline, a book that I've shared with you several times on the past few weeks. You can choose to serve or you can commit to being a servant. When you choose to serve, here's what happens. You, you choose to serve and it means you can choose when not to serve, right? And if you choose to serve, you can choose who to serve, and you can choose who not to serve. You can choose where to serve, and you can choose where not to serve. But if you commit to being a servant, then what do you do? You walk through life with your ears up, your antenna raised, and you carry God to places of need because you are committed to being a servant. You know, when you, when you choose to serve, it can be a, about you. Like, I really need to feel good about myself, so I'm going to help. When you choose to serve, you know, it can be temporary. When you choose to serve, you can kind of stop when it gets hard. But when you commit to being a servant, all of a sudden you communicate the Lord's love. When you commit to being a servant, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you unite people. All of a sudden you notice where the Lord's ministry is needed, and all of a sudden you are willing, willing to go. And so here we see that Jesus advised them what not to carry so that they would go empty-handed, depending only on the Lord for His strength and for His guidance and for His nurture and for His provision. A lot of individuals in this church give sacrificially to the ministries of, of this place. Many of you give to this place and you have other ministries you give to. Um, just as an aside, one smart thing to always do when considering supporting a ministry is to observe how the CEO or the chief minister travels. If they're traveling first class, run. Because that's not the way Jesus describes how we are to go. Dependent 
upon him for guidance and for strength. In Matthew's version of this sending, we're told who the disciples that Jesus called were and were given their names. And, you know, several of them, we know something about them. And I've often thought, gosh, surely to goodness the Lord could, could find somebody else to do what I sense that maybe he's calling me to do. There's somebody else who is more capable. There's somebody else who is more mature or more gifted. And then we read these Verses about these disciples that he had called around him. People like Simon, who were good at putting their foot in their mouth. People who were good at diving into ankle-deep water. Who were good until the heat got turned up. And he was called as a close disciple. And his younger brother, Andrew, who probably was in the shadow of his big mouth brother, Peter, Simon, the, his whole life. And who else was there? James and John, they're called sons of thunder, it implies that they have this horrible temper. Maybe they got their dander up before they allowed the reason to catch up with it. You know who they were. They argued about who's going to be first in the kingdom. And Jesus said, I want you to go. There were other disciples around, tax collectors, who were known for taking a little bit for Caesar and a little bit for themselves. There was a zealot who was a political fanatic. And you know, Simon the Zealot, we don't know if he would be called conservative or liberal, but here's what a zealot was. We don't, we don't know which end of the spectrum he was on, but he felt like the cure for the nation's problem was going to be answered politically, and Jesus called him. We look at others that are there, individuals that we never hear of again, and then people like Judas who would sell Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver, those are the ones that Jesus intended to carry the message to the world. And so if you ever are in the point where you are in the place where you feel like, gosh, is the Lord really calling me? Look at those first ones that he called. It's not about your ability and your strength and your capability and what you've accomplished or your pedigree. It's about the Lord in whose name you go. Now, it wouldn't be fitting... For me to preach on Super Bowl Sunday, a huge football fan like I am without telling some Super Bowl story, right? It isn't the point, though. <clears throat> the Patriots have a player named Malcolm Butler, and he played small college football in Alabama. He had transferred to two different small colleges because he had a hard time um, with, with his grades. He ended up settling in rural Alabama and playing on a small stage and working out when he wasn't working out for his team just across the river from the university in Tuscaloosa at a small gym that um, used to be a mom-and-pop grocery store. It was a no-name gym, indescript parking lot, and the trainer at that gym kept saying, Malcolm, um, you might get one chance if you're lucky. Nobody owes it to you. If you get your chance, you do it. If you get your chance, you do it. Well, of course, he was not drafted. There's seven rounds of 32 teams drafting. I don't know how many that adds up to, but there are a lot of people that get drafted. Malcolm wasn't drafted, but he was invited to try out. And he spent months working out in this no-place gym across the water from Tuscaloosa. And... Um, lo and behold, he would show up late for workouts, and ironically, his trainer would say, you know, if you played for Bill Belichick, he'd cut you. <laughs> you can't be late. Well, Malcolm Butler ended up getting a tryout with the Patriots, ended up walking on there and playing, not walking on, but ended up playing for the league minimum. And two years ago in the Super Bowl, he made an interception that allowed them to win. Now, I'm not pulling for the Patriots tonight, and I'm not encouraging you to either. <laughs> I'm not, you know. But after he made it big, multi-millions, um, he still goes back to that nowhere gym so that he can be reminded of how hard he needs to work, how hard it was to get there, you know. Now he's got the millions. He dreamed of guarding somebody like Julio Jones who played for the university. And guess what? Tonight he'll get to. You know, you 
I know each of you, many of you, have heard God's call in your life. Go. As you go, proclaim the good news. As you go, tell, share. And at one time, perhaps there was this fire and you felt this, this urging and this commitment. And maybe today you, you've relaxed just a little bit. Maybe because it's just the way life has happened. Maybe it's because you've accomplished some things or done your time. But I was encouraged this week when I read about this star who goes back to the beginning to remember how important this really is. Maybe today that's what you need to hear. Maybe today you need to put yourself in the place of one of those disciples who has been told to go and as you go proclaim the good news and as you do touch people and heal people in Jesus' name. You know, it is truly a privilege to be among the disciples of Jesus Christ. And these words that were spoken then are spoken now. And, and you've, you've heard them before. Today, will we hear them seriously again deep in our hearts? Jesus' name needs to go outside of these walls, outside of our families all through the community, all through the state and the nation and the world. And you know what? Jesus looks out at people like you and people like me and says, as you go, as you go, proclaim that good news. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we stand here today as people who have heard your call we ask that you would touch each of our lives in the appropriate places and in the right ways. We ask, Lord, that you would place opportunities to share in our paths in ways that we can see. We ask, Lord, that you would teach us to trust you and not hang on to our luggage or our baggage, but to hang on to you. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us in your way of peace Guide us as faithful, faithful witnesses. We ask this in Jesus' name today. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is one of my favorite ones that we sing. As a matter of fact, I changed it so we'd sing it this week. Hymn number 589, Here I Am, Lord. And maybe you have sensed God's call in some way in your life. You know, perhaps you have sensed a great need right in your family or with your spouse or among your children or maybe with your neighbor or a coworker. Um, this time as we commit is a time that we can pray and ask the Lord to give us the wherewithal to respond and say, here I am, send me. Um, let's stand and sing this hymn together. As we prepare to leave, I want to remind you of a couple of things. One, I want to ask Bonnie Carroll to come. The McPherson Wood and the Florida Moss Gatliff classes like to provide a gift for those who've made a profession of faith. And Bonnie did so several weeks ago and had, um, was baptized a few weeks ago. In our, and I've, this has been sitting on this for two weeks and I've forgotten it. So today they threatened to you know, shoot me with a pellet gun to get me to remember to look behind me here. But anyway, so, um, but that's from one, two of our ladies' classes that really, you know, so, so thank you for, um, I hope you'll enjoy that, and they just want to share that gift with you. And if you have not had a chance to sign Bonnie's um, board that will have her picture on it from when she was baptized, it's over on this, near this exit. So thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, and then also you heard several opportunities to get involved in ministries in our church. Um, the sharing supper, you'll get a chance to sign up for that in the evening. I mean, excuse me, sign up for that on your way out. If you were in Sunday school, you received a reminder about next week's dessert auction and a pancake breakfast next month. Chances to support our youth as they prepare to go to, to um, camp this summer. Um, and so there are many ways to get involved and serve here. You know, I, I want to give you just a practical way to perhaps prepare like uh, someone who would go back to his roots and train in a, just a no place place just to remind them how hard it should work. And maybe this week, one of the ways that we can um, go back to our roots is take out your to-do list and pray over it, asking God to guide you even in the minutia of the day. Look around your family, maybe around your classroom or around your office and pray and say, Lord, open up an opportunity for me to proclaim some good news somehow. Um, 
you know, there are so many places where, um, where Jesus Christ is needing to be shared, so many lives that need to be touched by him. And so maybe the place to start for us is to take every day something as simple as the to-do list or as simple as the relationships we encounter. Perhaps you get gas at the same place you've never gone in to meet someone who works there every day. Maybe this is a chance. Um, this week, let's get back to the roots of that calling and I just want to leave you with the words that Jesus said to his disciples. As you go along your way, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven is near. Amen.